Uh, good morning. I'm joined today by Deputy Attorney General Monaco, DEA Administrator Milgram, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Williams, Acting U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, Pasquale, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of California, Grossman, FBI Associate Deputy Director Turner, and ICE Acting Deputy Director Lechleitner. Today, the Justice Department is announcing significant enforcement actions against the largest, most violent, and most prolific fentanyl trafficking operation in the world. That operation is run by the Sinaloa Cartel and fueled by Chinese precursor chemical and pharmaceutical companies. The Justice Department is attacking every aspect of the cartel's operations. We have charged suppliers in China who sell fentanyl precursors to the cartel. A Guatemalan-based broker who purchases the precursor chemicals on behalf of the cartel. Operators of the clandestine labs in Mexico where the cartel manufactures fentanyl. A weapons supplier who arms the cartel with firearms smuggled into Mexico from the United States leaders of the cartel's security forces who terrorize communities, money launderers who enable the cartel to fund its operations, and the cartel's leaders, known as the Chapitos, who are sons of the now imprisoned former head of the cartel, known as El Chapo. Eight of those defendants are now in the custody of our international partners. We will be seeking their extradition to the United States to face charges in federal court and we will be working closely with our partners in the government of Mexico to seek the extradition of other defendants. The United States government is using every tool at its disposal to combat the fentanyl epidemic. The PRC government must stop the unchecked flow of fentanyl precursor chemicals that are coming out of China. Earlier this morning, the Treasury Department announced sanctions against two Chinese companies and five related individuals for their roles in the sale of fentanyl precursor chemicals from China to the Sinaloa cartel. Four of those individuals are defendants in this case. Before we provide further details on these actions against the Sinaloa cartel, I want to explain why we took them. Families and communities across our country are being devastated by the fentanyl epidemic. From August 2021 to August 2022, 107,735 people died of drug overdoses in the United States. Two-thirds of those deaths involve synthetic opioids, primarily fentanyl. Between 2019 and 2021, fatal overdoses in America increased by over 94 percent, with an estimated 196 Americans dying every day from fentanyl poisoning. These statistics are horrifying, but they do not begin to capture the reality of the loss that so many families carry with them every day because of the fentanyl epidemic. Many of us have heard the stories of those who have lost loved ones to fentanyl poisoning. In the face of unimaginable pain, those families have shown extraordinary bravery in sharing their stories. We are grateful to them. We, then know, we know that nothing can repair the harm they've suffered or bring back the loved ones that they have lost. But all of us at the Justice Department are committed to honoring their loved ones' memories. And we are doing everything in our power and using every authority we have to bring those responsible to justice. As outlined in an indictment unsealed today in the Southern District of New York, the Sinaloa cartel is largely responsible for the surge of fentanyl into the United States over the last eight years. That surge is a result of a complex and comprehensive fentanyl manufacturing and trafficking network orchestrated by the cartel and depicted on the screens above. First, a cartel associate brokers the sale and shipment of fentanyl precursor chemicals, principally from China, to clandestine labs in Mexico where the fentanyl is manufactured. Those labs are guarded by cartel security forces who brutalize and terrorize Mexican communities. From the labs, cartel traffickers move fentanyl from Mexico into the United States, where it is sold wholesale to other criminal organizations. Before resale, those criminal organizations often mix fentanyl powder into other drugs, 
such as cocaine and heroin. They also often sell fentanyl pills as counterfeit prescription pain medications. As a result, many Americans are unaware that they are purchasing and being poisoned by fentanyl. Finally, money launderers working with the cartel ensure that the profits from these deadly sales get back to the cartel. The charges unsealed today demonstrate the comprehensive approach the Justice Department is taking to disrupt the entire fentanyl trafficking ecosystem. The 23 defendants we have charged in this indictment represent each stage of the movement, manufacturing and sale of deadly fentanyl from start to finish. As alleged in the indictment, two of the defendants, Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar and Jesus Alfredo Guzman Salazar, are leaders in the cartel. Alongside Ovidio Guzman Lopez, a defendant who we charged in a separate indictment, indictment, also unsealed today, for his role in manufacturing and trafficking activities for the cartel. The indictments describe in detail how the Sinaloa cartel operates without respect for human rights, for human life, or the rule of law. For example, two of the defendants tested the potency of the cartel's fentanyl on individuals who were tied down. In another instance, those defendants experimented on a woman they had been ordered to shoot. Instead, they injected her repeatedly with fentanyl until she overdosed and died. And after an addict died testing a batch of the cartel's fentanyl, one of the defendants sent the batch to the United States anyway. As described in the indictment, the Chapitos security forces attack law enforcement, intimidate civilians, destroy unsupportive businesses, and capture contested territory. They often torture and kill their victims. They have fed some of their victims, dead and alive, to tigers belonging to the Chapitos. In another example, we alleged that four defendants were responsible for capturing, torturing, and killing Mexican law enforcement officers. One of the officers was tortured for two hours before he was shot by Ivan Archivaldo Guzman Salazar. U.S. Attorney Williams, Acting U.S. Attorney Pasquale, and U.S. Attorney Grossman will explain in further detail other court filings unsealed today in the Southern District of New York and the Northern District of Illinois related to the Sinaloa cartel. A separate indictment charging one of the leaders of the cartel's security forces is also being unsealed in the District of Columbia. The cases we are announcing today exemplify the comprehensive approach the Justice Department is taking to disrupt and hold accountable those who bear significant responsibility for this fentanyl epidemic. And all of the agencies represented here today exemplify the whole of government commitment the United States is making to that effort. The entire Justice Department, from the DEA to the FBI to our litigating divisions and across all 94 of our U.S. Attorney's offices, is working to keep fentanyl out of our communities and hold accountable the cartels and their members and associates who put it there. 2022, the DEA, together with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, seized more than 50.6 million fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills. That is more than double the amount seized in 2021. The DEA has also seized more than 10,000 pounds of fentanyl powder. Together, these seizures represent more than 379 million potentially deadly doses of fentanyl. That much fentanyl could kill every single American. We are also putting our resources to work to combat the public health challenges of addiction and substance abuse by supporting prevention and treatment programs. The cases we are announcing today represent an enormous amount of work from across the department. I particularly want to recognize the DEA and FBI agents who do difficult and dangerous work every day alongside our local partners to disrupt drug trafficking. And I want to recognize the department's criminal division, including its Office of International Affairs and its Narcotics and Dangerous Drug Section, as well as the U.S. Attorney's Offices for the Southern District of New York, the Northern District of Illinois, and the Southern District of California for their extraordinary effort on these cases. 
We are also grateful for the support of our colleagues at the Department of State, Department of Treasury, and Department of Homeland Security. And I want to express our gratitude to the many Mexican service members and law enforcement officers who have bravely put their lives on the line to combat the cartels in their, contra in their country. I want to again express my condolences to the families of the many Mexican service members and officers who have lost their lives in that effort. Just yesterday, we met with our law enforcement and security counterparts in the Mexican government here at the Department of Justice. Together, we renewed our commitment to working closely in the fight against fentanyl and firearms trafficking. Finally, the Justice Department will never forget the victims of the fentanyl epidemic. We will never forget those who bear responsibility for this tragedy, and we will never stop working to hold them accountable for their crimes in the United States. I'll now turn the podium over to Deputy Attorney General Monaco. Thank you very much, Mr. Attorney General, and good morning. Today, in the United States, an American dies nearly every eight minutes from fentanyl poisoning. The fentanyl crisis in America, fueled in large part by the Sinaloa cartel, threatens our public health, our public safety, and our national security. Today's indictments reflect the Justice Department's commitment to attacking every aspect of that threat and the cartels that drive it. From the chemical companies in China that spawn fentanyl precursors, to the illicit labs that produce the poison, to the networks, the money launderers, the murderers that facilitate its distribution. The Department of Justice is combating the cartels and the fentanyl epidemic the same way we've fought other threats, by targeting every aspect of their networks and by using all tools of national power to dismantle them. Just as we went on offense, against terrorists and cyber criminals around the globe, the department is now waging a relentless campaign to disrupt the production, the distribution, the trafficking of fentanyl before it can reach its victims. The cases announced today expose the threat in disturbing detail, from precursor chemicals to suppliers, from chemists and distributors to hitmen. Each of the nearly 30 defendants in these cases represent part of the machine that is pumping poisonous fentanyl into cities and towns around this country. But we won't grind the cartel machine to a halt unless we attack it from every angle. And to do that, we need to use every tool that we can and to join forces with partners around our government and around the globe. As the Attorney General described earlier this morning, the Treasury Department announced sanctions against two Chinese com companies and five individuals responsible for providing precursor chemicals to the Sinaloa cartel. And today, the State Department is announcing up to $56 million in rewards for information leading to the capture of these defendants. By combining our partners' authorities with our own, to disrupt the criminal networks trafficking fentanyl, the department and our law enforcement partners are expanding the battle space. But to win this fight, we must also work with partners beyond our borders. We must capitalize on the strength and the reach of our law enforcement partnerships around the world, including with our Mexican neighbors. Yesterday, the attorney general and I met with top Mexican security officials. We agreed that we share a common mission, protecting our communities. We thanked them for recent actions in service of that mission, including the capture of Ovidio Guzman Lopez, one of the Chapitos, who led the branch of the Sinaloa cartel responsible for large volumes of fentanyl trafficking. And we acknowledged the sacrifice of Mexican forces in this fight. The cartels that kill Americans with fentanyl are the same deadly forces that have killed brave Mexican officers. The blows that we deal to these cartels protect the citizens of both our nations. 
But we must do more than just cross geographic borders. We need to expand our efforts into cyberspace. Thousands of Americans, including children, are dying from fentanyl marketed and distributed over social media. It is no longer enough to protect our children from drug dealers in the park or on the street corner, because now those drug dealers are plying their deadly trade on social media apps running in the phones in our kids' pockets. Just last week, the DA administrator and I met with social media companies to discuss how they can and how they must do more to stop the sale of fentanyl on their platforms. Working together across the government, with the private sector, and using every available tool, we will defeat these cartels. The women and the men of the DEA, the FBI, and their law enforcement partners, including at the Department of Homeland Security, and the tenacious prosecutors across the, com uh, across the country who are represented here today, have worked painstakingly over many years to expose this threat and to hold perpetrators to account. They do their work to keep their communities safe and to honor those we've lost. It is a privilege to work with them. And now I'll turn it over to the DEA administrator for more details on these investigations and on our fentanyl strategy. Fentanyl is the greatest threat to Americans today. It kills more Americans between the ages of 18 to 45 than terrorism, than car accidents, than cancer, than COVID. And the number of children under 14 dying from it has increased at an alarming rate. At DEA, we decided to proactively target the criminal network that is most responsible for, fent for the fentanyl flooding our communities. We looked at our data and the answer was clear. Most of the fentanyl in the United States comes from the Sinaloa cartel. The DEA and our law enforcement partners took down the previous leader of the Sinaloa cartel, Chapo Guzman, or El Chapo, who is now serving a life sentence in a U.S. prison for his crimes. But El Chapo's sons, Ovidio, Ivan, and Alfredo, known as Los Chapitos, became the new leaders of the Sinaloa cartel. They inherited a global drug trafficking empire, and they made it more ruthless, more violent, more deadly, and they used it to spread a new poison, fentanyl. Let me be clear. The Chapitos pioneered the manufacture and trafficking of the deadliest drug our country has ever faced. And they are responsible for the massive influx of fentanyl into the United States. As a direct result of their actions, we have lost hundreds of thousands of American lives. And so the DEA proactively targeted the Chapitos network, and we followed it across the globe. To China, where the Chapitos partner with Chinese chemical companies and brokers to acquire fentanyl precursors, the ingredients necessary to make fentanyl. To Central America, where the Chapitos work with brokers who help transport fentanyl precursors from China to Mexico. To Mexico, their home base, where the Chapitos run secret laboratories, transform fentanyl precursors into fentanyl powder and pills, and smuggle it into the United States by land, by air, by sea, by underground tunnel. And in the United States, where the fentanyl makes its way from stash houses near the southwest border, across our country, reaching both coasts and everywhere in between, and killing Americans from all walks of life in every state and in every community in America. The Chapitos control this global criminal enterprise, and they use ruthless violence to protect it. Indeed, death and destruction are central to their whole operation. To dominate the fentanyl supply chain, the Chapitos kill, kidnap, and torture anyone who gets in the way. In Mexico, they fed their enemies alive to tigers, electrocuted them, waterboarded them, and shot them at close range with a 50 caliber machine gun. 
to drive addiction, the Chapitos hide fentanyl in pills that look like oxycodone, Xanax, or Percocet. They mix fentanyl in with cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, all to induce Americans to take fentanyl without knowing it and to get hooked on it. Every day, we at DEA hear devastating stories of Americans who took a pill thinking it was a legitimate prescription medication, not knowing that there was fentanyl inside, and they died. And we are working tirelessly with the families who have lost loved ones to raise awareness, because many Americans don't know about the dangers of fentanyl. But the Chapitos know. They know their product is deadly. These are people who gave fentanyl to a man, watched him die, and then sent that same batch of fentanyl to the United States. They know that they are poisoning and killing Americans. They just don't care because they make billions of dollars doing it. Their greed is shocking and without bounds. Today's indictments strike a blow against the Chapitos and the global network they operate, a network that fuels violence and death on both sides of the border. Seven members of that network have now been arrested pursuant to our investigation in Colombia, Greece, Guatemala, and in the United States. Ovidio was arrested earlier this year by military officials in Mexico. I want to thank the 32 DEA field offices and our law enforcement partners that worked here in the United States and abroad and worked tirelessly on this investigation. And in particular, I want to thank the men and women of the DEA's Special Operations Division Bilateral Investigation Unit. Today's indictments are only the beginning. This case should send a clear message to the Chapitos, the Sinaloa cartel, and criminal drug networks around the world that the men and women of DEA will relentlessly pursue you to save American lives and to protect the national security of the United States of America. As the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, I have the honor of leading the women and men who bring some of the most significant investigations and prosecutions in this nation. To me, this indictment is the most significant of my tenure. It is the most urgent. And that's because fentanyl is the most dangerous drug this nation has ever confronted. Let's just be real for a moment. Fentanyl doesn't care about who you are, what you do, what you believe, who you love, who you might be leaving behind. It doesn't care if your first time using it is your last time. That's because fentanyl doesn't believe in second chances. This drug is designed to destroy. This drug is designed to devastate. And just like that, it can take you. This is a national nightmare. It's a law enforcement crisis and a public health crisis. We recognize the threat and we're fighting back. The action we're taking in the Southern District of New York is the most ambitious fentanyl prosecution in American history. We take aim at the Sinaloa cartel and the global network of death that feeds it. We have indicted the cartel's leaders, the China-based suppliers of fentanyl precursor chemicals, the cartel's manufacturers in Mexico who turn those chemicals into fentanyl pills and powder, the traffickers who import that fentanyl into the U.S., the distributors who provide that fentanyl to drug dealers in the United States, the money launderers who fund the cartel's massive fentanyl operations, and the cartel's armed soldiers who violently protect the cartel's fentanyl trafficking routes, laboratories, territory, and personnel through torture and murder. Let me end with a message to every American who has been touched by this crisis. Know this. We are not going to give up. We are not going to forget. We are not going to turn the page or move on. And we are not here to pat ourselves on the backs. We're here to roll up our sleeves. We're going to do everything we can to seek justice and to hopefully save the next family from feeling tomorrow the pain that you feel today. Good morning, I'm Morris Pasquale, and I'm the acting United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. The Northern District of Illinois' charges announced today 
are the latest in a series of indictments brought in Chicago, San Diego, and Washington, D.C. against Sinaloa cartel members and their associates. Our offices, along with law enforcement partners, including HSI, FBI, IRS, DEA Chicago, DEA San Diego, and the Chicago Police Department, have collaborated for years to effectively prosecute leaders of the Sinaloa cartel. Dozens of high-ranking Sinaloa members and associates have been convicted and are serving long prison terms because of those prosecutions. The Northern District of Illinois indictments against the Chapitos represent a broad-based effort to dismantle the cartel. They provide a substantial step in bringing this younger generation of Sinaloa cartel leaders to justice for more than a decade of harm caused by their enterprise. For decades, the Sinaloa cartel has trafficked illegal drugs into the United States and, e and used violence, even violence against law enforcement to do so. This criminal enterprise's drug trafficking, including the trafficking of cocaine, heroin, methamphetamine, and the violence resulting from that trafficking has had a particularly destructive impact in the Chicago area. Chicago has long been a transportation hub and a significant market for the cartel. The damage that these dangerous drugs have caused in Chicago's neighborhoods is truly immeasurable. Combating the trafficking of illegal narcotics remains a top priority of the United States Attorney's Office in Chicago. We will continue to aggressively investigate and prosecute individuals from the leaders of the cartel down to the local trafficking organizations who are flooding Chicago with illicit drugs and reaping profit from the destruction that they are inflicting on our communities. Our work in this important area continues. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney General Garland, Deputy Attorney General Monaco, and Administrator Milgram for your leadership. And thank you to my colleagues at Maine Justice, the Northern District of Illinois, and the Southern District of New York for your partnership. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of California is proud to participate in delivering the most crushing blow to the Sinaloa cartel since the conviction of El Chapo Guzman. Today, because of the dedicated work of federal prosecutors and agents from multiple law enforcement agencies in the United States and support from Mexico, we are announcing indictments against El Chapo's four sons, the Chapitos. Our charges date back over a decade and seek justice for a criminal enterprise that has flooded our nation with deadly drugs and perpetrated murder to maintain its power. In the Southern District of California, we know the Sinaloa cartel is not an abstract organization operating in a far off place. It's responsible for funneling tons of drugs across our border with Mexico and directly into our streets. As alleged, fentanyl has become a focus for the Chapitos and Sinaloa cartel. Our district knows the impact of the fentanyl crisis all too well. Drug seizure statistics show our region has become an epicenter for fentanyl trafficking into the United States, and overdose deaths in our communities have risen to unprecedented levels. The devastation from fentanyl is felt everywhere in our district, and that has been an extraordinary call to action. And we are meeting that challenge with a two-part strategy. First, to relentlessly pursue justice for overdose victims and their loved ones by targeting the suppliers responsible for this crisis. Everyone, from the cartel leaders to the street level dealers, we are taking their drugs, we are taking their money, and we're taking their freedom. The second part of our strategy is prevention through multiple outreach and education initiatives. Raising awareness about fentanyl saves lives. We are just as engaged in the classroom as we are in the courtroom. The U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District of California, with our domestic and international partners, is committed to dismantling the Sinaloa cartel and other drug trafficking organizations. Today, 
we've proven the power of strong collaboration in achieving that goal. Comments by the President of Mexico that fentanyl is not produced in his country, which this case obviously refutes. Could you speak candidly to the American people about the challenges you're facing in getting the Mexican government to do everything it can to capture these wanted traffickers and otherwise disrupt the cartels? And then if I could just ask on this leaks case that we're all talking about, I know you can't probably can't comment on the details, but as a senior national security official in the government, are you concerned that the U.S. national security apparatus does not have a handle and is not properly monitoring the 1.3 million uh, Americans who have top secret security clearance. So starting with the second question first, since everyone is talking about it, um, I'd really just point you at what the Secretary of Defense has said, that the Department of Defense is leading a, an important effort now to evaluate uh, and review the national uh, security implications and most important to conduct a review of the methods of access, accountability and control procedures. Uh, that the department has so that something like this can never happen again. On, on the more general question, we met um, yesterday with all of the major security ministers in, at, in, of Mexico, Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Navy, the Attorney General, um, the Secretary of Interior Security, uh, the Foreign Minister, uh, and we all know that we need to work together continually uh, to, to strike against this uh, enemy that is uh, injuring people in both of our countries, uh, is killing uh, law enforcement and service members in Mexico, as well as individuals in Mexico, communities in Mexico, and is doing the same in the United States. So we will be working together uh, on all of these matters. Hi there, okay, so um, Deputy Attorney General, you had mentioned uh, you know the role of social media companies in uh, cases like this. I was hoping I could trouble you to elaborate on the role of social media in this specific case and also what your interactions with those companies have been like. And then Attorney General, if I can ask you a question about our Wall Street Journal reporter, Evan Gerskovich. Um, you know, you've been a long time advocate of press freedom and so I guess I'm wondering what you think Russia's arrest of an American journalist on espionage charges says to you about the state of press freedom around the world. I'll start with the second, and then I'm sure it'll be no trouble for the deputy to answer the first. Um, look, um, the United States has already made clear that this is a wrongful detention uh, of uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter. Uh, this kind of case just shows how important uh, freedom of the press is in all countries around the world, in our country, but even more so in countries that are making it increasingly difficult and dangerous for... Uh, the free press to operate and to report what is actually happening in that country. The United States will do everything in its power uh, to get the reporter back. Um, and now on the social media question, I'll let the deputy answer. Thanks very much, and, and thank you for the question, Sadie. Uh, look, I highlighted the um, role of social media uh, in this threat precisely because we are seeing more and more often that social media is a feature of and is involved in the cases uh, that we are investigating. Uh, all too often, we're seeing that that's where the meat happens. That's where the first connection is made. That's where the terms of the deal are being hashed out. Uh, and so we have to include this as part of the entire supply chain. Indeed, the social media apps that are part of this distribution uh, and sales of deadly fentanyl and other synthetic opioids really are part of the supply chain. Indeed, they're the superhighway of this supply chain. And that's why uh, we recently met with representatives of the social media companies. Um, they need to do more uh, to address this, the sales of this uh, deadly um, and illicit drugs on their platforms. Uh, we had a substantive conversation, I would say, but it's just the first of what need to be many more steps uh, to address this problem. And I don't know if the DA administrator wants to comment at all. I would just say very broadly, um, in the investigations that we are continuing to run throughout the United States on the Chapitos and the Sinaloa cartel, we see social media across investigations in every single field division that we have. What we are seeing is cartels and networks like the Chapitos are using social media to recruit couriers, 
They're using it to show weapons flashes, to show videos and photos of the drugs, the fentanyl powder and pills that they're producing. And they're also using it with their traffickers and their associates and their facilitators to do, as the deputy attorney general said, sell their drugs and get into every single house in the United States of America. Because anyone with a smartphone who has access to social media within a few clicks is now able to purchase drugs. What social media companies are doing is they are solving the last mile problem for the cartels. They are getting the drugs after they've been produced and manufactured, and they are getting those pills and those powders across the United States. We have more than 200 million Americans who have social media accounts, and so we know that they are harnessing this and they see it as their best opportunity to relentlessly expand the Sinaloa cartel's business. Um, on the cartel case, I was wondering, could you speak a little towards how this, this large case is going to halt the flow of fentanyl into the U.S. that we're seeing every day? And, and separately, on the leaker case, could you say whether there's any other suspects you're looking for and whether there's any kind of foreign nexus at all? So on, on the last one, you all know me pretty well. You know, we have a pending case. Um, um, uh, there was just his uh, first appearance was this morning. Uh, the detention hearing will be held on Wednesday, um, and I'm really not able to talk anymore. It's an ongoing investigation. Um, and on the first, uh, we have no illusion that any one case will stop fentanyl from coming into the United States. I think the uh, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District said it very well. That this is just one important step that we're taking. Uh, to help dismantle this uh, cartel. We have to be relentless about it, and we will continue to be relentless about it. And the thing that makes this case particularly important is that we're going after the entire network, from precursors to importation into Mexico, to the manufacturer, to the weapons, to the money launderers, to the distribution in the United States. But we, this is just one uh, uh, of the most important cases we've brought, but we will continue to be, uh, I shouldn't say it's one, it's actually at least five, um, but we will continue to be doing that. Uh, back on the leak case for a minute, um, what message do these charges send to anyone who would take home hundreds of classified documents? Uh, let me talk somewhat more generally. Um, um, thanks for the question, Devlin. If this is not just about taking home documents, uh, that is, of course, itself illegal. Uh, but this is about the transmission, uh, both the unlawful retention and the transmission of the documents. Everyone knows here that the documents, in the end, were uh, transmitted. Uh, that violates uh, 18 U.S.C. 793 and 18 U.S.C. 1924. There are very serious penalties associated with that. Uh, people who um, um, uh, sign agreements uh, to be able to receive classified documents acknowledge the importance to the national security of not uh, disclosing those documents. Uh, and uh, we intend to, to uh, send that message, uh, how important it is uh, to our national security. Last question, Dave. So, on the, uh, on, the, on the drug case, what is your understanding of how much territory the cartels control south of the, of the, of the, on, on, the border, on the southern border? And designating them foreign terrorist organizations, would that give you, would that make any more tools available? We're speaking about where you're using every tool available. Uh, secondly, on the leaker case. That sounds like it's all right. Oh, yeah, it's all right. On the leaker case, yeah. um, he was he was in court already this morning, obviously in federal court in Boston. Yeah. Does this mean categorically that this is going to be handled entirely by the Department of Justice, or could this end up being in a military charges as well? So I don't want to speculate about the latter. This does mean that this case is being pursued in federal uh, civilian courts, um, and the next uh, appearance, as I said, will be a detention hearing on Wednesday. Uh, that's how uh, the, the Justice Department proceeds. Uh, I don't want to say anything about what, what, what else might be uh, possible. Uh, let me see if I can go work backwards. Uh, from, just remind me for one second, the second. Uh, how, many, how many, you know, what is your understanding of how much uh, territory the Sinaloa and other cartels, you know, control along the border? And would designating them a foreign terrorist organization help in any way with giving you more tools? So on that question, of course, the designation of a foreign terrorist organization is up to the State Department, and we'll defer to their judgment uh, about that. We have, uh, as this 
case shows we have an enormous number of tools already. Uh, uh, the, um, they have already been designated as um, um, transnational uh, criminal organizations. Uh, we have the ability, and particularly with the um, um, uh, sanctions that the Treasury Department has uh, just laid today and has laid in some of these cases before, uh, to uh, prosecute every person along the chain. Uh, the DEA is not restricted to only prosecuting events that happened in the United States as long as they had an effect in the United States. Uh, on the question of the amount of territory, I'm not sure. There's nothing in, in the papers that explains that. I'd be happy to leave it, uh, have the DEA administrator say something. But uh, uh, this is really outside the scope of, of what we're doing here. Thank you.